So uh, this is a really important topic that Sarah and I have, this is our fourth time that we've, we've presented this topic, um, one at the Milestones Conference, and then we've done, this is the third one here for our coffee and chat, so it's a, it's a very, very important topic, and I'm, I'm so glad everyone is here. And we'll have this discussion. Um, I want to invite you to, as we go through this, I want to really invite you to um, not shame and guilt trip yourselves over what I am or am not doing, you know, but rather looking at this more open, you know, what am I doing, uh, celebrating the things that we are doing with the siblings, um, and then what are some other things that I would like to start to incorporate? Um, our, our homework, I think, is a really uh, good one because it opens up the line of communication. And I think that's one of the most important things uh, that we want to consider you know, as we go through and look at the needs here. So uh, we, and then after, we will uh, have any discussion or questions or comments. So we'll start with the, the needs of the sibling. Um, and so if you want to consider or write down any questions or comments, go ahead and do that. So the first one that we're looking at is that siblings need communication that is open, honest, and developmentally appropriate and ongoing about their siblings' developmental delays or disabilities. This can mean any kind of a disability, not necessarily just a, a, a delay of any sort. Um, and I think the key here is communication, communication and openness and developmentally appropriate information. So of course you're going to talk to, you're going to talk differently with your teenager than you would maybe your you know, six-year-old, seven-year-old, eight-year-old. I will also uh, have available, and Sarah will have available resources. I have a, a list of books um, and resources that could meet this need, and it's, some of it is broken down into age. Um, and I think there are also some resources over on the table. So again, um, open communication. Uh, number two is siblings need parental attention that is consistent, individualized, and celebrates their uniqueness. Uh, so I think that's, that's self-explanatory. Again, attention and time is a, is a commodity that is sometimes limited. Um, but I think the consistency is what what we're looking at and the attention, the consistent attention. Just as you celebrate every milestone for your child with a disability, celebrate the milestones and achievements of brothers and sisters. Um, just remembering and keeping that in the forefront, um, you know, as well. Because a lot of times this, the, the, your child with a disability or the special need can oftentimes be the center of, of your thoughts and meeting their needs. We're just looking at, let's celebrate everyone, all in the family's uniqueness. Um, siblings need time with a parent that is specifically for them. And again, time is a, is a, is a limited resource, as we all know. Uh, we're talking about, you know, you could look at doing something, um, some suggestions might be 10 minutes in the bedtime or nighttime routine. You could do five minutes after school where it's just yours and the siblings time together. And you want to label it that. You know, this is, this is Johnny and mom's time or this is Sally and dad's time together. You know, even doing errands together, just that one-on-one that -on -one time can be everything. Um, and it doesn't, again, it doesn't have to be monetary. It doesn't, it can just be your special time together. So you could break it down into 10 minute, five minute inter intervals daily, or you can do some have suggested date times or you know, that kind of a, a label to it. Um, siblings need choices about how involved they are with their brother or sister. And I think what we're wanting to look for here is being reasonable with your expectations of the sibling. Um, because there can be so much going on, you oftentimes, we all oftentimes will delegate, right? Delegate things to do. Just being very realistic what, with what the expectations you have and asking. Again, it's that, that open line of communication 
where you're asking them about how involved they want to be or don't want to be. Siblings need to feel like they and their belongings are safe from their brother or sister. Um, I've worked with a lot of siblings of kids with disabilities and special needs, and I think this is one of the primary concerns I hear kids talking about, um, is you know, they will oftentimes come in my room and destroy some of the things that are really important to me, or I don't feel like I have a safe place at home, or I just want to be able to, you know, have my space that is separate. Um, sometimes that can and can't happen in terms of space in your house, but again, creating as much safety for belongings and um, space as possible. You might even need to consider, and some people have considered lock boxes to put special things in, or door locks if they're separate, if they have separate rooms, and and one of the children is very intrusive and doesn't respect the boundaries of a door closed. Those those could be some things that you may consider. Again, um, talking with your the sibling about how would they like. What would they like it to be? What, what are the safety concerns? What would they like mom or dad to do? Um, and safety is a basic need, right? We all need to be able to feel safe, as well as our as belongings. Um, siblings need to feel like their brother or sister is being treated as normal as possible. Um, so you might want to explain differential treatments, uh, what some of the service providers are suggesting and expecting. Um, and another thing I was thinking about is doing some preparation for this. You know, your pediatricians are also great resources in terms of helping explain things, helping your the siblings to understand things. There's often a very close uh, connection and trust there. Um, if you're ever not sure on how to talk about issues or what's developmentally appropriate for them to know or understand, again, pediatricians are a great resource for that. Um, siblings need time to work through their feelings with patience, understanding, and guidance from their parents, um, a close family member, or a professional if appropriate. Um, first and foremost, you'd love for the kids to be able to talk to you about their feelings, right? I mean, that, that's number one. However, are, are we aware, are you aware of how much kids will protect their parents in terms of feelings and emotions? So one of the siblings might not want to tell mom how frustrated they are or how ashamed they are or how embarrassed they feel because they're afraid that could hurt mom or dad. Um, and that's where you might want to consider you know, having a counselor or having an aunt or an uncle or, or a cousin or somebody that they can share these feelings with. Um, that's one of the most important things. I think when Sarah and I, this was a, the story that really stays with me, uh, when we were talking about feelings, the siblings' feelings about their sibling. And a mom became really emotional when her daughter told her that she was really embarrassed by her sister. And mom was really, you know, cried and, you know, had a really hard time with that. It's okay to feel whatever, whatever they feel. You know, if they're feeling angry and frustrated or sad or embarrassed, those feelings are all okay. You know, we all have our feelings. And so again, it's giving them the opportunity to have that safe place and that safe person to talk to. Siblings need opportunities to experience a normal family life and activities. I think this is another really important one. Um, I think respite cares are valuable. Uh, Connecting for Kids provides that so that you can provide some of those normal, so to speak, experiences for your typically developing child um, where you're able to leave uh, your child with a disability or special needs respite. It's not punishment in any way, shape, or form. When I've made that suggestion before to parents, um, there's, there's sometimes this guilt that I don't want to punish them or I don't want them to miss out. Um, I, I think you don't want to come at it with that approach. This is not punishment. You can make a fun respite. 
they can have fun in another area or with someone else where you provide just that normalized opportunity for yourself and, and the sibling. Um, so that can be very beneficial for all. Siblings need opportunities to feel, to feel that they are not alone and others understand and share some of the same experience. experiences. Using Connecting for Kids to find other families in similar situations is a great resource um, where, if that's at all possible, linking siblings, linking families. Um, I'm not sure of groups that are out in the communities, but there may be groups out in the communities. Um, I know we had often, we had talked about that, creating a group at some point. Um, so again, allowing them to feel that they are not alone in this experience. Siblings need to learn strategies for dealing with questions and comments from peers in the communities. And community, and this is another really important one. You can do role play with them. Um, you can have them give you some suggestions or ideas on some of the questions they have heard and they haven't known what to say or how to handle it. You can sort of walk them through if they have any concerns on their own. And always, again, just opening up those lines of communication um, about how they want, how they would handle things or where they might have some struggles. Again, this is a, the teachers or guidance counselors could also be a resource here. So many resources and, again, communication. So what we're going to do, the next part that I wanted to walk, walk you through is the homework. So this week we are going to ask you to sit down with, this, with your sibling and walk <coughs> them through the list of 10 things kids often need. Ask him or her which of the needs is the most important to them. You may be really surprised by what they express as their most important need. You know, you might, I would also suggest before you show them, maybe this list of 10, why don't you ask them first? You know, that might be something to try. Ask them first. And then if they're struggling or they're not sure, then maybe you want to give them the list of 10. Um, try to come up with a way to meet that need while acknowledging limited time and budget. For example, while it may be unreasonable to have a one-on-one -on -one date night every week, it might be reasonable to do it once a month. And what I love about these needs and, and some of the ideas here, I don't think anything that was suggested here uh, required monetary resources. You know, again, date nights can be going for a walk or, you know, date days, whatever you want to call it, going for a walk, going to the library, um, going to the mall for a walk, uh, playing a game together where it's just one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, label your time together and your actions. Be intentional with your language. For example, if you can commit 10 minutes at 8 o'clock each night with your child, label it as your special time with me. And when 8 o'clock comes, use that language. Labeling it our time together, mom and Johnny's time, dad, and is really important. Again, that's really going to be set with your child. Commit to check in with a sibling on a regular basis and make sure to fulfill your commitment. Use transition times and milestones as a reminder to intentionally ask what the, need, what the child needs. Be sure to follow through on what you say you will do. If a date night gets canceled, immediately reschedule it. You can even have calendars and you put it up on a calendar where you make it visual, you know, celebrate it, make it exciting fun, that kind of thing. Again, even just playing a board game together can be made fun. It's, it's the energy that you put behind it, special time. 